All right, Fred, why don't we go ahead and get going? Others can sure. join as we go. I'll do a real quick introduction and go from there. I'm, Sounds like a plan. Hello, everyone. I'm Ken Knickerbocker. I'm publisher of uh, Vista Today, Monco Today, Delco Today, and Buxco Today. Um, uh, each of those publications is a uh, member of the American Community Journals. We started about eight years ago, and our focus is on uh, publishing positive, upbeat stories that are engaging, interesting about things happening down the street and around the corner from you. It's basically celebrating each county's uh, uh, commercial community and, and uh, cultural uh, experience and environment and ecosystem. So we're glad to have you here. Our focus has always been on finding topics that are interesting and engaging and have that I didn't know that element to them. And that's really what led us to Fred and Creative Capital Wealth Management. Uh, several years ago when Fred joined us as an affiliate partner, we started doing the weekly Wiser Wealth columns. You know, Fred talked to me about uh, his investment strategy. And he, you know, it's, we we're talking about the big dogs today, investing like the big dogs, but the, the big dogs, as he explained it to me was, uh, investing like the big institutional investors do, the people that have uh, large trust funds, uh, the people like Harvard and Yale with those uh, trust funds and how they invest and maximize their in investment opportunities. And so I, I was intrigued by the topic and thus uh, I thought we'd do a, a noon Zoom with Fred today about it, just some housekeeping issues and then I'll turn it over to Fred we're, Fred's going to take about a half an hour with his presentation with questions and answers afterwards. So the last 10, 15 minutes, we'll do questions and answers and we'll wrap up again uh, on the dot 10 minutes before the hour. So Fred, I'll turn it over to you to All right. the, your definition of big dogs. What's yes, well, thank you very much. So, so some people think um, 20 years ago when I started the company, I was a genius. I was just trying to survive I'm literally in Valley Forge. So two Val you know, obviously Valley Forge is Vanguard's zip code. We use them a lot. So I wasn't trying to rebuild them. And every financial advisor looks the same. So I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to um, speed up the fact of, you know, who knows what's going on most of the time. And when you Google, um, you know, best portfolios or best performance, Harvard and Yale foundation. They're, they're multi-billion dollar foundations. They keep coming up and they'll keep coming up as, you know, how did they invest? How did they do last year? How they do during COVID? And what intrigued me, how they invest is public. Like it's, it's out there in an annual report. So it's out there. You can do it. You can do it. If I, this starts getting boring for you, you can do it while you're listening to me. And what's intriguing uh, to me is 80% of where they have their money is not in stocks and bonds. And 99% of the rest of us are stocks not stuck, but we are only, our only options are stocks and bonds and mutual funds and ETFs. And they're all, they're all in there. So that started me down saying, Hmm, I wonder why that is. And then when you figure out, or when you find out, and again, this is out there, but you got to look for it. The amount of tickers. So individual stocks is only about 3000. So we think the market, the stock market is this huge ocean with these gigantic boats. And I'm telling you, it's a four inch, you know, deep pond and the boats have very flat bows. Like it's not, it's not a deep ocean. And if the smartest kids in the class, the Harvards and Yales and the big foundations and, and some of the bigger firms you know of, if the smartest kids aren't, aren't at the beach, where are they? And that's, that's what started my company. Um, and thinking different isn't just the Apple catch phrase. I think it's the way you make big progress. You know, if you're, if you're following the herd, that it typically that ends up not being good for the herd. Um, so the, the institutions in our case are people with a lot more zeros. However, I'm going to share with you what we do uh, for and what we do with accredited investors and what that is. And there are so some things that non-accredited investors can do. So this isn't meant just to be a tease of if you were rich, here's what you could get. Um, I think you need to know what's out there. I think this is educational first. Absolutely no sales, absolutely not even names of products. Um, this is really meant to educate you because the longer I've been in this, uh, and I've been doing it for 20 years, so I started when I was nine, I'll, I'll throw that out there. Um, the more I take for granted that I know things people don't even know exist. And, and when I talked to Ken about it, it, it was like, what do you mean? How is that even a thing? I'm like, oh, you know what? I've been in this world for 20 years. 
by myself. And so these are my way of giving back, of educating, and, and hopefully, you know, giving, leaving you in a better place than where I found you, especially with where the economy is and going, where the everything is and going. None of us saw 2008 coming. All of us see the storm clouds on the horizon, and we don't know what kind of storm it's going to be. We don't know when it's going to hit, but there's no way we're going to assume it's not going to impact somebody, if not all of us. And so this is hopefully a way. You'll be talking a little bit about that storm today with inflation. Yes. And so my big, my first give to you, to ever all the listeners, either live and also on the replay, um, and it's something you don't need an advisor for, you don't need to pay anybody for, go to treasury.gov. It's the government's website. Um, and they have an inflation bond. It's called an I bond that is guaranteed to pay you 9.6. There's no mutual fund. There's no stock. There's no bond other than this bond that I know of that's safe that has that same number. So that's the good news. And you can put a little bit in, you, the, the, the downside is you're capped, each individual social security number is capped at $10,000. So if you have, you know, if you, if you want to start to invest, that would be probably the best thing because it's an inflationary bond. It'll go up if inflation gets uglier, which probably will. Um, and it's, it's very, you know, it's very flexible. It's just like those, those bonds you had, your grandmom had, except for now they're paying real interest. Um, and you have to keep your money there a set time? There's, there's, so you have, um, the answer is yes, if you want the full interest. If you get out early, you get less interest. But it's, a, it's not meant to be a savings account. It really is meant to be a longer term investment. The longer you're in it, the more you're going to make. But that has zero accreditation. Uh, as long as you have the money and you have social security, you can get into it. So that's, that was my first gift to you. And inflation will be, and all of these investments that we're going to talk about, assumes inflation assumes a correction, assumes that storm clouds coming in. So now if we know things are going to change and not change for the better, where could we look at for putting money? That's what this is about. Good. Sound like a plan? Yep. You have so a Vista has a disclaimer, and this is a great disclaimer. This is me talking, not them. And then I have a disclaimer, which is I'm educating. Don't do anything. Don't invest in anything we're talking about. I'm not giving you any names of what you can invest in anyway. This is really meant to educate you. This is almost a redo of the lunch Ken and I had where I shared with him. And he's like, I never heard of that. Tell me more. And I never heard of that. Tell me more. And then he's like, we got to tell other people this stuff because I never heard of that. And you may not tell this, but Ken's a little older than me. So he's been around the sun a few times and he's never heard of this. And, and these are things I think people need to know about. My intent is to show you either things you are striving for at some point, you may be a credit, you need to know what's on the other side of the hill. You may be morbidly curious of, of if you hit the Powerball, what would you do? And then the part that, that drives me is I always had the feeling the rich got richer because they knew things the rest of us didn't. I didn't come for money. I'm the only kid out of three that went to college. Um, I was my mom and dad's Hail Mary pass, frankly. And so knowing that that was a feeling I had Finding out about accreditation, and this is a good, good segue to that. Accreditation is a fancy word. If you feel the rich get richer, because they know things you don't know, that is not only true, but it's also a government program. Accreditation restricts the solicitation of the investments we're showing you to the general public. Meaning if you were a client and, and, and I were gonna show you an investment with the name and, and you really go into the details, I would have to already know all of your information, which you don't know that in a general public. So these are not things you're ever going to see a mutual fund for. They're not things you're ever going to see an ad for um, because it's restricted and it's meant to protect you. So it's not a, a bad thing. It's meant to protect you because these are usually illiquid, usually sophisticated. I like the ones that aren't sophisticated, but you know there are credit investments out there that are sophisticated. And what accreditation is, is a threshold of a million dollars in net worth, not counting your house. Now, that million dollars can be in your 401k, it could be in your business, it could be in a baseball collection, it doesn't have to be investments, it just has to be net worth, part of your, part of your net worth, a million dollars not counting your house. So some of the neat things I want to share with you are meant to educate you on, on that over the hill. Besides the I-bonds, which you do not have to be accredited, uh, there's another investment I want to walk through that, again, you do not have to be accredited, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. So this really isn't meant to be Here's all the stuff you can't have if you're not accredited. It's meant to educate you on that and also show you some things that you could have if you're accredited. And again, you don't need me for any of this. So this is educational. I just want to share with you. Yes, you can. Uh, there's also a salary requirement, isn't there? If you don't so have for accreditation, million dollar net worth, 
Um, 175 Whoa. of sat or 175 of salary if you are an individual, 300 of um, of income if you're married. And so you have to validate that before you can invest, but you don't have to validate that to learn about it. And so you know this is really a, an open. And I want to answer any questions you have. Um, I'm not going to describe the world that you that we think we should have. I'm going to describe the world that we have. And so we just have to deal with it and we'll, and we'll do it that way. Um, so there are some that otherwise mentioned, but assume everything I'm sharing with you is for accreditation because that's what this workshop's about. This is all the cool stuff we've been doing for 20 years. Um, but you also will learn, even if you don't invest in it, you'll, you'll learn a little bit about, you know, different ass assets and different alleys that you didn't know existed, which I think is, is good for everybody. So I broke this into growth and income. And again, all of these assume inflation, all of these assume a correction, all of these assume yeah. water's going to, are, the seas are going to get choppy. So on the income side, there's a few things here that even I'm learning 20 years in the business. And one is that a public company can have private stock. And the private stock means there's no volatility because it's not a public stock. And that's something I, I know we all know of good private companies like Wawa, and we know of public companies like Tesla. What we didn't, what I didn't know is a private company can offer a public company, I'm sorry, can offer private stock. So we're going to go into what one of those looks like. Ironically, that's one, the private stock, you only have to have a very little bit of accreditation, meaning 70,000 of income or 70,000 in net worth. So I'm hoping for most of you. That would be like an, an, you know, an appetizer of these bigger things. We're also going to talk about how people do real estate. If you look at the wealthiest people in the world, they have the least amount of stock. And what do they have? They have cash flowing businesses. They have real estate. I'm going to talk about how they do it and how you can do it um, and, and how we're doing it you know, in, our, in our office. Um, taxes, believe it or not, no one wants to pay taxes. And there are legitimate, ethical, moral ways uh, and strategies to that the government sanctions again these are all these are all you know i'm assuming everyone including ken and mitchell are finra uh, you know regulators so i am i'm this is a tight i'm only going to tell you what what i'm allowed to be telling you but so everything i'm talking about is is going to be the way it is and also an accurate description so there's oil and gas that come with some tax credits i'll walk you through um there's a company that we use and this is actually um ken this is the company that does the lagoon communities this is how they do it. So I'm going to walk you through. Brilliant. I met the guy. He's brilliant. It's not yet a public company, but they're, they're, off, they're raising capital to build these houses in, in uh, Texas and Florida. And their claim to fame is it's all in pricing and their houses are 400 to 600,000. They're not trying to build the McMansions. And as interest rates go up, as they will, people's buying power goes down. So they're going ahead of like Wayne Gretzky says, they're going where the puck is, which will be affordable. You know, 400 to 600,000 doesn't sound affordable. In this world, that is very affordable for brand new construction. That is all in pricing, and all the finishings are the nice finishings without having to upgrade. And then, if um, if you have capital gains, there's a strategy out there called an opportunity zone that I want to highly go through. And some of these, each of these, probably could be a you know a noon zoom by themselves. But getting into the details, that's when the listener on your end needs to, to you know say that they're they're accredited. So we're not going to get deeper than we're allowed to in this in this educational forum. So let's talk about private preferred stock. Um, the one that we have, and this is one I'll, I'll share with you. It's a public company. They're selling private preferred stock and it's a three-year commitment on the investor side. So private means there's no, it's no, it's not affected by how the public company stock does. Preferred means it's higher up the, the you know, the safety. It's, you know, there's stock here and then preferred's up there. Um, it pays 6% to the investor. And you're in it for three years, but during those three years, we're going to get through probably that correction, um, the election. Like they, we just want to, you know, have a place that is safe-ish. But here's the best part of it: it is backed by farmland. And if you read about the food insecurities, everything else, no matter what happens, I you may not buy a Tesla, but you're going to eat. And so the interesting thing about farmland, and again, I don't mind telling you all the things I learned, but if you have, and this this farmland uh, private preferred stock only does of recurring crops, like almonds and pistachios, for example. And what I didn't know, and I learned, and now you're gonna learn and at your next cocktail hour, you'll be able to say, well, you know, you can, if you have a recurring crop like pistachios or almonds, the company or you, if you're the, the investor can depreciate that crop because you don't have to replant it every year. And more importantly, 
the whole farm can be the crop. You don't have to set the, some part of the farm away to have an off season, like get the grass and the soil back up to snuff. You plant the whole crop on the whole field and depreciate the whole thing. So a lot of that 6% to the investors is tax-free because they're depreciating plants, which I, again, 20 years in this, I didn't know they could do it. And none of this is new. None of these are gadgets. This is just how it's always been done. So that's an interesting thing. Again, no common stock exposure. Cool thing in my world is we find the capital for the, for the investments and they pay us for finding the capital. Where if I was, uh, and I was a regular stock broker, I want to buy a bond, there, was a, there would be a commission in the transaction. Ken wants to get in this. I'm taking my cut before the investor gets into the investment. In this world, if you're an accredited investor, you're special. There's not a lot of people that have a million dollars not net worth. Our office is special. There's not a lot of offices around the country that do what we do. So we get paid for finding it. So you put 10,000 in hypothetically, your first statement shows 10,000. You didn't pay me, they did, but it didn't come out of your money. So that's that to me, that's important because people know how things work. Um, this is a snap, you know, a full, you know, my full, full Kimona, they call it. They're doing $6 million um, or 6 million shares. It pays 6%. Um, it's not listed. So again, it's not on the stock market. Um, if you get out early, there's a 10% haircut. So that's what this says. They plan to, um, when the three, when your three years is up, you're going to get cashed out or you can turn into the public company stock and that's your choice. So, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, the risk you're taking is, is the company going to last three years? And my thought is, are we going to still need food three years from now? And I think the answer is a, a resounding, of course. So um, of everything we can put money into, this isn't something I consider risky. Um, this is important. So they pay up to 6%. Let me go back um, to the advisor, to me, and they pay all these other fees. But, and this is why you see, this is the only one I'm ever going to give you the name of. Um, Gladstone pays all of the expenses. So, so it says that right here, we will pay, no, they Gladstone. So if you have an advisor, ask them if they have the Gladstone land preferred stock. You don't need me for it. This is not an accredited, you know, as long as you're 70,000 of income or 70,000 of net worth. Um, this is the second, the I bonds. And this thing here is the, is, are the two that anyone can do, almost anyone can do. And you don't have to be the high level accreditation. Um, but we are putting accredited investors in this because they like farmland, they like 6%. Three years isn't a long period of time. And a lot of them are already in real estate. So having 6% that's different real estate or not even, you know, it, it's a lot of farmland. It's not even considered real estate from this standpoint because it's a preferred stock. So Gladstone Land is the name of the company. It's a public company. You can research it. What you can't do is buy the private preferred stock from them because they're not in the business of selling private preferred stocks. They are the company. So you have to go through an advisor like me or anyone else that has access to it and, and you know, invest through that way uh, Fred before so next on, is the issue yeah, sure. before you move on there's an article in today's Wall Street Journal about uh, private investors coming into the private preferred stock and private bond marketplace because of the volatility of the securities marketplace right now they're trying to avoid daily price swings that they see in you know those 3,000 stocks that you were talking about. Do you see a lot of that happening? Yeah, so um, I, I can tell you my secret sauce is I, I study the, the Harvard and Yale annual reports. They're public, you can do it too. And I look and see where do they put money? And then is there a way that I can put my client's money in there? And, and if so, what's the vehicle to get there? So we've been using private preferred stock, frankly, because they've been using private preferred stock. And they are the institutions that Ken's referring to that now there's articles about, hey, other people want to do it. So everything... Um, that, that we've been doing is not new to us because it's not new to the, the, the institutions. And so it is, you know, it is, and, and that's why after a while of 20 years doing this, I just assume it's out there, but there really isn't, there isn't a lot of education out there on these types of things. And there's not a lot of advisors when I was, if before I started my own company, I couldn't offer this and, and I couldn't offer any of the accredited investors. So the, most of the financial advisors don't have access to the product, so they don't even know about it. And if they did, they probably wouldn't tell you about it because they don't have access to it and they're not going to make money anyway. And they're not going to tell you to go do it if it's outside of them. You know, and if you do have an advisor who hasn't told you about the iShares um, government bond outside of them, I would question that. 9.6% backed by the US government 
they're not going to make a dime, but if they care about you, they should have told you. So I'm telling you, because I don't even know you, but I care about you because I don't need your money, but I want to give people the education they need. I didn't have. And, and so um, absolutely private preferred stock. It's not a new thing. It's just a new thing to us that we found out about it. And I think there's a component where if everyone did what really makes money, no one could do what really makes money. Meaning all of us can't go buy private preferred stock. There wouldn't be enough. Or we would drive the price up so much it wouldn't make any sense. So there is definitely a element of um, keeping things quiet. Or if you ever watched Fight Club, no one talks about Fight Club. So the joke I have is, you know, no one talks about credit investments because we want to keep the credit investments for us as, as, a, as a general, you know, industry. Which I'm I'm happy to lift up the velvet rope and let people in who should know about it and have the assets to do it. Shoot, Ken. But and if we go over, I'm going to be blaming you because you're. Yeah, I know, and I'll, I'll take the call for it. Someone's asking, uh, can we roll money from a 401k into these investments that you're talking about? Yes. So, so not the iShare because the government doesn't do you know IRAs, um, but the the preferred stock that's the the Gladstone. You just need a, a custodian that. And there, there's a bunch out there. We have one. We use one. But you just need a custodian that that is in the business of owning and holding a credit, you know, non-public. This isn't an accredited investment. But the answer is yes. You have to have the right custodian. Um, and if your advisor has access to the to the strategy, they probably have access or or are a custodian that can hold it. Um, but they do go back hand in hand. You have to have access to the product, and which means that the person you're working with needs to have a sales agreement. And that really means they checked out the firm and the firm checked out the product and they both liked each other. Um, and as long as you have a custodian, we have a ton of money in this and all 6% again, isn't going to change your life, but you're not going to be down 30 when the market goes down. And that's really what this is about. This is about protecting what you have um, in a way that you, it, it's, it's not vapor rare. Like there is, it is backed by farmland. And, and the real story is they go to the farmers who are struggling. We know why and we know how, um, you know, crops costs are up, gas is up for the tractors. And so they buy the land, they buy the farm from the farmer and lease it back to the farmer. So at the end of the day, the farmer has the same farm, but now he also has money in the bank to farm the farm that he just sold the farm. So it's a kind of a neat circle, but it's, again, this is how life works. It's not whether it's good or bad, or we want it, you know, is that the perfect way? I wish the farmer could keep his farm, but he can't. So at least we're paying him and we're getting paid too. So tell so, us about uh, Cash DST. Institute. Yes. So, I mentioned the more money someone has, the less money they have in the stock market. So where do they have money? They have it in real estate. You can go buy a, a real estate without me. If you're buying real estate individually, you're probably overpaying because everyone that looks like you is also trying to buy that same piece of property. And that's just where we are in the world. Um, institutional real estate is a $80 million Amazon distribution center that was built last year or a $300 million multifamily that was started in 2019 and then paused in 2020 during COVID is now finished. And now the builder just wants to get out of Dodge. So you can own institutional real estate. This is as an accredited investment. You can own it. And let's say you put 100,000 in. A lot of these things don't have huge minimums as long as you're an accredited investor. You don't own it like an investment and you don't own it like a REIT. If you're familiar with that, you own it like real estate which means if you put cash into a, into a DST and that stands for Delaware Statutory Trust, that's the, the, the shell that, that owns the real estate, you are a partial owner of that real estate. So in five to seven years, when they go to sell, again, you are on the plane, you're not driving the plane. You have no liquidity. You have no say on what happens other than you sit back and get your money. And then at some point, they're going to land the plane or stop the train, whatever analogy you want. And when they sell that, Let's use Amazon as, a, as an example. Amazon Distribution Center, they sell it in five or six years. There's still what's left of the 20-year lease. There's 15, 14 uh, years left of the lease. Um, they're going to sell it to somebody else. And then you're going to have the chance, let's say the 100000 now worth 190. I'm making the numbers up. You have a chance. You can cash out and pay taxes. You could. Or you can roll into another DST that you choose and not pay the taxes. But which one do you think people do? So... My kids are going to college because we have enough money out there of DSTs. No one ever wants to pay the taxes. So I know when they come due, they're going to say, Fred, what, what do you have next? Can we do storage? Can we do it? And when we say institutional real estate, what kind of returns are we looking at? Typically 10 to 15. Do they make more? Yes. Have they made less all in? 
Yes, but typically eight to 10. And that's in like a worst case scenario because you really don't lose money in real estate unless you sell to, you know, and either unless you tell, sell too early or you're in a very unique real estate like a hotel and a COVID happens. So these are not hotels. These are, these are COVID. I'm assuming something like COVID's coming back. I'm assuming in a recession's already here. So these are very defensive. And what does defensive institutions look like? We talked about Amazon. Resist, res, recession resistant retail. Dialysis Center is a perfect example. They were open during COVID. Grocery stores. Even if you didn't go to the grocery store and you use the app, someone's going. And I don't think there's any time in the near future Amazon's going to drop peaches from a drone cost effectively to us. So um, resistant retail is not strip malls. It's not the malls that, that we're seeing people move out of. It is it is the CVSs. It is it is you know you know Pet Boys. Things that are going to be needed no matter what. Um, storage. People like their stuff. I have to be careful. If, you know, kids might be listening to this. So I'm going to be careful. But people like their stuff, and as as people move, they their stuff moves with them. We talked about grocery stores, multifamily. There is a supply and demand mismatch. Um, everyone thought none of the uh, millennials would ever buy a house. Well, that was wrong. They didn't want to start there. But when they do, you know, so someone were getting families like I can't raise a family in an apartment, but there's so many more people that need the apartment. So multifamily apartments are not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and then senior and college housing uh, in the right areas. So so not ancillary, but, you know, um, University of Arkansas, like really University of Pennsylvania, like really big um, places where people move there to go to school there. They're going to have to live there. Um, so senior and college housing. Mobile home parks are a good version of these uh, DSTs because there's a limit to supply. Nobody wants one in their backyard and a lot of people can't live anywhere else. So they have to have a mobile home. So that's the DSTs. This is the tax credit idea we're talking about. Um, and here's how it works. And, and these are going back to 1942. So I think the simpler thesis works when the you know what hits the fan. And these ideas are not new. They're not gadget plays. They've been played so often so well that people assume that everyone knows what they're talking about. So in 1942, uh, we wanted to be as a country, energy independent, World War II, all that good stuff or bad stuff. Um, so they said, if, if you are going to go look for oil or gas, the IRS will give you the ability to, re to deduct this expense of looking. So using 100,000 as an example, that's not the minimum. Um, you can do less than that. If it's a, let's say 80% deduction, you put 100,000 in an oil and gas tax credit investment, you can write off 80% off your income. So that $80,000 off your income didn't pay any taxes. And that money you would have paid is in your pocket. That's a big thing. So if you're a high earner and you work for somebody else, you don't have any of the bells and whistle Ken and I have as business owners to write things off and buy things and depreciate. You know, there's a lot of risk with, with being a business owner and you can't, you pay for unemployment, but you can never be on it. Like there's, there, it's not always the best thing ever. But if I'm a W-2 employee, all I have is my paycheck. So after you get your paycheck, what can you do to reduce your taxes? Oil and gas tax credit is one of the few plays you have. Uh, and anyone can use it as long as you're accredited. Um, so what do you get after you get it? You usually get a 15 to 20% return. Um, it is, is a delayed return because again, they have to look for or find and, and build um, the pipelines. And you're owning the pipelines. And then you get the upfront tax benefits and then you get this distribution. And we all know, and our mom and dad's probably told us there's no free ride. What's the catch? The catch is in our $100,000 example, you're never getting your $100,000 back. It is in this investment forever. And it, you'll get paid for as long as all the, and it's not one, one well or one pipeline, it's hundreds of them. As long as they're making, um, taking oil or gas, in this case is a gas play that we've been using, um, in Western Pennsylvania, as long as they're making money, you're making money. So the break even is six to seven years. In six to seven years, between the tax the taxes you didn't pay, so that's in your mark pocket, and the income you got from the investment, you're made whole, and you still get paid for 15, 20, sometimes 30 years. So it's a cool thing when it works. Um, that lack of liquidity sometimes is a showstopper. So five to seven years, um, some of these wells have paid well beyond 50 years. We're talking sixth generation getting a royal check from something great, 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 great grandpa Nickenbacher did. Um, I'm just going to throw tennis by example for everything. Um, and I've and this is an example. You know, you want to know who's behind it. Um, Snyder's who own the Washington football team. They have a program that's out there. 
Uh, it's not open this year. It's not open yet this year. It's open every year. But here's the cool thing. Every client has the right to ask me, am I in it? And then when I talk to a sponsor who's doing these things and getting them regulated to go out into the world, I ask them the same thing. And very rarely is the answer yes, and it's 50%. In this case, it's yes, and it's 50%. So I'm going to quickly do, um, do the other ones, and then we'll open it up for some questions. This is the, um, it, it's a loan, it's a private, it's a fund that loans money to a construction company, and they pay you 8%. And it's a five-year um, five year hold. So it's out of the market. It is for accredited investors, but each loan is secured by a deed on, on the ground. So you don't have, they're not building communities, hoping people move in. They don't, they don't tie up the, the they don't take money out of this to build until there's a non-refundable deposit and the buyer has been underwritten. And this is the company. So, so, you know, this is the company that I like. They have all in pricing and their houses are between four and 600,000. The only downside is it's Texas and Florida. So nothing around here but they're building lagoons of crystal clear water that are football sides. And this is where, and, and, you know, so people would be buying these houses without the lagoons, but the cool thing is the lagoon is a tax credit from the borough. So they're not paying for the lagoon. The, the, the boroughs of the Texas and Florida areas are building these. Um, they want the lagoon because it brings in the restaurants and the nightlife and all the things that could be built around the lagoon and obviously property values and property taxes and income tax and all the other stuff. So communities like this, they have 12 already under, um, under agreement for already moving dirt. So it, it's an up and coming company you've never heard of that you probably will once they go public because um, they've really changed, you know, all in pricing is crazy. So if you sold something and you had a capital gain and it could be anything, it could be a baseball card collection or a, or a property, an opportunity zone fund is what we use to, to not pay the taxes on that gain. So you defer it, they're not eliminated, but you also only can use the capital gain. So if you sell something and you get your money back, the cost you, you know, your cost basis comes back to you and you do something else with it. Only the gain goes into these uh, opportunity funds, which is an interesting thing. Typically income starts around year three because these funds are usually building something from scratch and it takes that long to build up and lease out and then get income on. And an example of this is West Philadelphia. Cantor Fitzgerald has an opportunity uh, project in West Philadelphia. It's a life sciences center. Um, I'm in it personally. And, and that's, you know, so you, these are not small projects. These are typically, you know, 800 to 100 to $900 million projects. Um, 15 to 18% IRR, that's the amount of money you should be making all in. And the, um, the downside, is some of your money needs to be in it for 10 years in a day. So again, if, you're, if the IRS is going to let you not pay taxes or defer taxes, there's going to be gotchas. So these are, you, this is where things get a little bit you know, sophisticated. My takeaway for you to have a takeaway is, hey, I have a capital gain. It's the most I've ever had in my life. What do I do to not pay taxes? Think opportunity zone fund and you know, find someone that specializes in that like us, doesn't have to be us, and, and work through it. Um, so... Growth, oil play, we've talked about that. So there's another oil play where they uh, buy in North Dakota, they buy uh, oil producing parcels and then just add more pads to it, which makes sense. But here's the catch. They then take those, all those pads and aggregate it and sell it to an ExxonMobil, a Shell or a Chesapeake. So clients get eight to 10% tax-free for three to four years, and then they get their money back plus 50%. And then they do it again. So these are these are out of the market. These have nothing to do with, um, you know, with commodity prices. That fifty percent payout is is the their their um, their guesstimate, but that's at fifty six dollars a barrel oil, and oil's over hundred. So if oil comes down to sixty, we're going to still make more than fifty percent. And I don't think in and this is twenty twenty six is when this thing comes full cycle. So a lot of these investments have what's called a life a lifespan. You know, they fund. They do their job and then they get out of job, you know, they get out of dodge, give everyone the money back and, and hope to do it again. Private equity is easy to explain. It's private, it's Richard Gere and Pretty Woman. So, so if you don't have private equity and you're a credit investor, you absolutely should look at it. It is the largest asset allocation of those uh, foundations we talked about, and it is the longest held asset allocation they've ever had. So if you were gonna say what was the first alternative institutions did, the answer is private equity. And the difference between private equity and the stock market. The stock market, our theory is we buy, hold, and hope. We hope Tesla's worth more because we bought it, or we hope IBM is worth more because we bought it. 
private equity doesn't buy a company until before they already know who they're going to fire. They already know who they're going to going to turn around. So think of private equity kind of like being a, a house flipper. They're not going to buy a house unless they know what they're going to do to flip the house and sell it relatively quick. So private equity does that exactly. And then there's there's opportunistic funds, which are short lived based on what's going on in the world. And there's two that we've been seeing uh, and we've been funding. One is hospitality. There are brand new hotels that were just built at the wrong time during COVID and they are struggling or they're already bankrupt. And these opportunistic funds go and either help the struggling company for a piece of equity turn around or they buy it out of bankruptcy and run them. And, and if you've seen anything, people have a pent up demand to go out and do something because we get and yet to do it for over a year. Um, another opportunistic fund is one that invests in family owned manufactured housing and RV vehicle uh, areas. Again, supply and demand, no one's building more of these. But if, you're, if Ken had a, a, a mobile home park and we asked him, why do you run it this way? He may say, what's well, the way my dad did it. And if Ken's dad's alive, we asked him, his dad probably would say, I don't know. This is the first time we've ever owned a park in our family and it's just the way we did it. So there's a lot of not well-run parks because they're run by a family and they got 30 members of the family living off of the park. So what this company does is it buys it from the family, gives them good money, and then runs it like a business and adds money to it. There's RV uh, parks today in the world that don't have the hookups for the $500,000 Winnebago's. Well, we buy one from a family, we put in those hookups and we add amenities. You can see how that makes money. And that has nothing to do with the, with the overall economy because this one fund does two things. Obviously, manufacturing housing is not for the richest people in the world. And $400,000 Winnebago's is not for the poorest people in the world. So this one fund does the same thing, buys it from families and adds value and then eventually sells it to an institution that wants a cash flowing portfolio. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to questions. Uh, Ken, Mitchell, any other questions? You know, and this is just more on the RV park uh, and the mobile home park. It's all the same fund. Yeah, so um, we only got two questions so far. So okay. you know, everyone that's attending, um, you know, this is your chance to, to send in some questions, you know, get some answers, uh, you know, from a professional. So. Whether you use the chat or the Q and A, just you know, send over your your questions, um, and we'll get to them. Uh, but the first question is um, from Jay. He says, "Fred, I've read a lot about people like Walt Disney, J.C. Penney, and many others getting their start using cash value life insurance for a non-accredited person. And given the future of tax hikes for all, not just the rich, what is your opinion of tax-free options with death benefits?" Yeah. So uh, what he's talking about is there's a, a legal and ethical and moral loophole of overfunding your life insurance so that the cash in the life insurance policy is, is tax treated differently. So absolutely. I have three of those policies um, and I'm looking at putting them some on my, you know, having my kids have policies, but here's, here's where they fought. So it's the super funding your life insurance. Absolutely. A, a policy, a, a strategy anyone should look at, and you don't have to be accredited because it's life insurance. The downside is I've seen the, the good strategy get mucked up when the sales guy, the life insurance guy or girl, um, generates more commission for themselves, which means there's less money going into the cash value. And I don't blame them for doing it because if you do a, go to a person who all they do is sell life insurance, they're not trying to get you the cheapest commission for them life insurance. They're trying to get you to buy the most expensive life insurance that fits your needs. And that's a different dynamic. So if you can find someone that either specializes in this or you have other business with them so that you know they're not going to gouge you on the life insurance side, um, absolutely look at it. It is creditor proof, which is awesome. If you never use the money because you die, there's a life insurance to your next generation, which is obviously ta uh, you know, tax free. But if you build up this, this bucket of money and then you need it, you can borrow from your own money to go and do something else with it. So again, I have two of these uh, working on a third. I have families and friends that buy it for individuals in their business and they own it personally. So you can look at, you can Google like 770 plan, the Rockefeller method. It, it When you talk real life insurance, people back out of the room or run out the window or just jump out the window. So they're packaging the concept. And the last thing on the last page is when they say it's life insurance, but don't be scared of that. It's life insurance is life insurance. If done right, it is a valid and a, a great investment. And you can get investments in life insurance that have nothing to do with the stock market 
So it's like an index, um, either indexed on the S&P, which means if the market goes up, you go up to a cap. But if the market goes down, you lose nothing. Or um, you get a guaranteed policy, which is the kind of policy your great granddad would have, where it's a five or six percent dividend, which is an airplane taken off five or six percent. But if you make five to six percent every year, even when the market's down 20 or 30, that's where the tortoise beats the hare. Long enough time, it'll always win. So absolutely, sorry, I went a little long. Uh, you can Google it. We obviously do it in, in, in our office and we shop it around. The only caveat I would say is not only the person doing it, make sure that you see what they're getting paid and what the levers are. Um, the second thing, and this is just the way I think, I believe in best of breed. My MBA paper was based on best of breed. So if I'm going to a guy or girl that works for X company and all they can show me is X company's life insurance policy, I'm going to question that. It may be the best policy he can show me from X company. We are independent brokers. We can show every company. So we shop it around at the company level because the strategy is valid. Um, the policy could be valid. The question is, is there a better policy out there? Good question. Thank you for that. What else you got? So Jay actually has a follow-up question. Um, he says, Fred, I've also read that the life insurance industry is the only industry that doesn't want you to upgrade to their newer products, given the older ones charge more. Is that your belief and understanding? It really, it, that's, a, that's a, not a wrong um, macro thought. Uh, what's really going on behind the scenes is life expectancy. And we haven't seen the next roll of life expectancy numbers, but 2020 didn't help. Um, and diabetes doesn't help. And all the things that are kind of you know, so we're not necessarily living longer than our parents anymore. I think it's going to trend and, and get better. So the short answer that could be true, but there have been companies that their newer policies have different um, numbers that they that they they jigger it a little bit different. So uh, what they tend to do is make a policy that they can support from an actuarial standpoint. Sometimes it's more uh, expensive than the policy that was before. Sometimes it's less. It's basically a per company per policy. There are times where the company that we use this month has the best deal for a client. And that same company next month has the worst deal for the same client. And the really what happens is the actuary says, how old can, do we have enough people that age? No, we could use a few more. Okay, well then we're gonna, you know, here's the quote for Ken. A year later, we got 50 Kens now. And like, how old can, how's the next? Well, we don't want any more. So we're going to price our policy a little bit different. So the Kens of the world says, well, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else. So short answer, that could be true. It really depends on, and that's why you, that, that's why if you're not at the same company or you don't work with a guy that, or girl that only represents XYZ company and that's it, you don't get that shop around, you know, leverage for you as, as the consumer. Okay, great. Awesome. So um, I wanted to share with you one other thing, everything that we showed about, I don't make anything. And I think that's important. None of this is Fred. None of this is creative capital. All of it is off the shelf, third party, FINRA regulated, SEC, you know, um, uh, sent to the SEC for review. None of it's my, and I don't work for any of the companies that I shared with you. I know I didn't share the name, but the strategies behind it. Um, what we do is, is retainer-based advice. And what I wanted to, and Ken asked me to just leave away. Um, so I have a team. So this is not going to make more work for me. You can go to our website. Again, that's a very long URL. So just go to the website. We do um, a free uh, second opinion service. We call it SOS. So if anything, you're not sure, we have a whole, it's how we help people and we don't qualify at this level. We don't care how much money you have. We care if you have a question, we can help you. And it can be virtual. So if you're still- Fred, unable, what, you know. what is an SOS? Uh, so what? SOS is, is, I wanted to do a way of giving back and also- a, an easy way to start a conversation, not knowing where it's going to end. So SOS, I thought it was kind of cool. It's a second opinion service. And the concept is the person, you can't get a second opinion by the person that gave you the first. And there are some good advisors out there and we know who they are. And when we see what they do, we see fingerprints of, of authentic integrity. And that's awesome. And we don't, you know, we look at your guys good, great. Or your girl's good. Um, there's other people that, that the advisor's sell the thing of the day or thing of the month. And so investors end up with a, um, a hodgepodge of stuff that have no correlation to each other or it's all correlated the wrong way. And so our second opinion service is coming into one of the wealth strategists. Sometimes you get me, I love doing it, but my day has been, been filled with other things running the company. And, and I, I think I shared with Ken, we're in 24 states now. So that's 
that's that's 23 states more than I wanted to be when I started this. So it's 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 bigger than I thought, but I'm not gonna not gonna stifle it. So it's a free meeting um, with one of our our, our advisors um, where we sit down, we'll bring you in, and we just meet them where they are, answer any questions they have about their stuff, things we can't do in a public forum. Obviously, we're not gonna ask people their their private information, and then tell them they're doing fine if they're doing fine, because we don't want to waste anyone's time. Give them some recommendations if they can tweak things with their person. Again, we don't want to waste time just doing, you know, and and or if there's value we can add that they need, we would say, oh, one thing we could do different if you did here, but that's that's not the intent. It's just one of the three options out of the SOS, if that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions? Um there was one question Jay asked, and I'll ask this real quick, Mitchell, and then yeah. go to that fossil fuel one that's up there. But Jay asked if he could have that chart that you had up just a moment ago uh, when you were talking about your services. Yeah, hold on. And we can send that out after. Let me, uh... the, the previous, no, go back. Oil and gas? No, go. Uh, it was towards the end. It was right before the SOS slide. Okay, cool. Sorry. Sorry, let me just. You'll get there. Mobile home. Next. There, that one. All right. right. So this is, um, oh, I never talked about this. And this would not be the commercial. Um, we, I created a, uh, I thought retainer based planning was something that was neat, necessary. And so I trademarked retainer based planning, but you can't trademark that like you can't trademark vanilla ice cream. So this is what we call our milestone clarification process, our MCP, it's, it's our thing. And these are just the components that make the, how we got the trademark. We have one for business owners, one for working professionals, one for entrepreneurs, which have multiple businesses, and then one for high net worth retirees, because why not, you know, it's, it's everyone's core business anyway. Um, and so we have one of these, that is tailored to each of those profiles. So that's not an investment. This is just our, our you know, this is, when I say retainer-based planning, no one really does it. So no one knows what it is. Um, we, Ken and I were joking in the green room that the, the problem with being a disruptor is people don't know what you do because you're doing it different than anyone else. So this is, this is what, why we're in 24 states. It's a lot easier to hire someone for advice and not give them any money because you're just getting them for advice. That's a lot easier to do with the, someone, you know, across the country than writing a check to, to someone that you don't know. Fred, there's one last question. Let's get to it. Mitchell, do you want to ask it? Shoot, sure. Yeah, so um, this person says, won't the move away from fossil fuels impact future returns? Yes, well, I think um, current, again, current reality is natural resources equate to national security. There's no way around it. We can't, we can't say we're not making oil here, but we're going to ship it from overseas on these gigantic, you know, very polluting tankers. Like there's a lot of stuff that I scratch my head saying, why, why, why is no one questioning some of this stuff? Um, we, sh as a country and as a world, 15, 16 year old Greta should not be driving how we run our country. Um, and it will be very uncomfortable, uneconomic and very bad for a lot of people going rushing away from fossil fuels. Because think of it this way, everything plastic comes from oil. Everything electronic is plastic. Like, like there, there's so there's so many uh, perfect world. We all have fan, we all, you know, we have wind and solar and, you know, it's going to hopefully our kids will get there. Um, I, all of the investments we have, so that oil and gas that I talked about, that is, you know, that right off, the break even is in six years. I have no, that does not keep me awake to know that oil and gas is going to go away in six years, not maybe 60, maybe 160, but not in six. So yeah, over a long enough period of time, survival for everybody's zero, but over a long enough period of time, absolutely right. And I hope it happens where we're cleaner and where I have a Tesla, not for any political reasons. I just love fast cars that, you know, drive themselves. Um, I plug into Limerick. I plug into, you know, uh, so it's not green in my mind. It's, it's, it's you know, and so Short answer is yes, over a longer period of time, all of these investments um, are, we get our money back on a very short time frame because that's the most, that's where the value is. Now, I said some of those oil and gas that have paid for 50, 60 years, they're not going to be at 18% for 60 years. Like over time, either through the price of, of the natural gas 
or the fact that there's just not um, as much coming out of the ground because we've already talked a lot out of the ground, it'll slowly go down. But at some point, let's say in 20 years, it's down to 6%. That's still more than anything a stock has. Go ahead, Ken. Yep. Finally, at 12.50, let's talk one minute. Let's take one minute and talk about our next noon Zoom schedule for June 30th. We're going to do a mid-year economic update. Tell us about that. So I, I'd like to, uh, and I'm going to try to get a speaker who's not me, but I've been doing it before for our clients, uh, a little bit of where we are, how we got here, and where we're going from a financial standpoint. Um, it is very difficult to get the facts in this world that we're in. Everyone is in their own version of an echo chamber, and no matter what your view of the world is, as soon as you like it on Twitter or Facebook, you're going to get it fed to you, that view of the world. And unless you go out of your way to see the other side, you're not going to know it exists. And so um, it is, it is, you know, so one of the things I'm going to add to that is a simple, you can overly complicate and life is complicated. There's no easy answer to anything. So we're just going to go over very broad things we can't control, but things we can kind of see on and just what the numbers say. And, and there are going to be speedometers that are going to be green, yellow, or red. And we know what green, yellow, red means. And so we're just going to go over what's going on there. Um, there's very difficult time to procrastinate. History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes awful lot. Yep. So if you think of early 70s, Carter years, recession, energy, you know, it's going to be a little bit similar to that. And I think it'll be a little bit more extreme. And it's going to be extreme for a bunch of reasons. And it's not any one person's fault, but we've all kind of gotten ourselves here. And we want to know, you know, what here is. So it'll be a very economic, no products, no spiel, no nothing, just an economic review of where we are. And I hope the numbers are better, you know, than they are right now. But we're probably in a recession. We just won't know it until the government is the last one to tell us. You'll have to get a different crystal ball if they're not. Yes, yeah, I do have, a, but yeah, it doesn't work. Oh, very good. Well, Fred, this has been great. It's been a thanks, Ken, and thanks for everyone who joined. Well, well, thank you for your time, and thank you for the uh, for joining us today. Uh, join us again on June 30th for that mid-year economic update. We'll sign off and have a good day. Thanks. Fred. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.